Welcome back to Fake Team TV and friends this week with our guest host, Toyin Crandall. A lot of people go on social media with their guardrails down. We're just scrolling, we're just here, different things like that. But it's like, in one sense, on one post, you're seeing genocide. And on one post, you're seeing a meme that's making you laugh. It has such a significant impact. So it's really being an active steward of your life. When we look at what's on our plate, are you on the plate? And are you prioritizing yourself? And of course, not from a selfish standpoint, not from a selfish place, uh, but from a place of wholeness and wellness, uh, because that is what we were created for. On the show, we've talked a lot about the different challenges and issues that Canadians are facing right now. And today's episode is going to be a little bit of a different angle. Today, we're going to be having a conversation around the mental health impact that these types of challenges are, um, are having on Canadians, but not just the impact of it on Canadians, but some of the things that you can do. Today, we will be talking about workplace stress and burnout. We'll be speaking about social isolation and loneliness, how to address the impact of social media, improving access to mental health services and supports, as well as daily practices that you can adapt to be able to strengthen your mental health. I am honored to have join us today, Jessica Robinson Grant. She is a clinical social worker, a licensed psychotherapist, and the CEO of Soul Care Christian Counseling and Consulting. And I'm looking forward to this conversation. Let's get to it. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. <laughs> yes. You know, I, I've really been looking forward to this conversation because as you know, there's been just many different um, issues that have been happening across the country that have been impacting Canadians. And it feels for many Canadians, it feels like they're being impacted on many sides. You know, for a lot of people, there's a lot of housing. Uh, there's the housing affordability crisis that's going on. There's some bills that are being passed around, you know, medical assistance in dying. Inflation is happening. The cost of living has gone up. Up. So for many Canadians, you know, we are seeing that there's been a lot more pressure on them just as, as human beings um, than before, than ever before. And yeah. I wanted to get your take on, first of all, I was wondering, what are some of the most common uh, challenges on and, and how how are these challenges impacting the mental health of Canadians across the country? What are you seeing in your practice? Um, I think one of the main things, so I serve um, a very Gen Z millennial um, population. And so this is the generation now that is transitioning into these aspects of purchasing homes and having children and different things that the generation before now that is stepping into retirement. Um, and so a lot of people are really stressed out, like stress management, burnout, overwhelm, um, workplace stress is a lot of the things that we are navigating through together um, when we are in therapy. Burnout is huge. We are talking about how to manage your stress, um, how to, to navigate through the workplace and how to mitigate burnout and really, really take care of yourself um, while managing all of the different moving pieces um, a lot of my clients, they are working sometimes two, three jobs to um, allow ends to meet and different things like that. And of course, that has an impact on their mental and emotional health. Um, and so that are some of the that's some of the things that our clients are navigating through right now. You know, when you speak about it, it makes a lot of sense, you know, for many Canadians maybe needing to take on a side hustle, take on additional work in order to take care of their families. And then the, the impact of that stress on them and even for the ones that are maybe working at one position, but yeah. the heightened stress just from yes. there's a greater level of competitiveness in the workplace today yeah. than there ever was. So what are some of let's start there. Let's start with the workplace kind of stress and burnout. What are some of the things that 
strategies that individuals can use to try to manage that uh, that workplace stress and to towards preventing burnout? Yeah, for sure. One of the things that I talk to my clients about all the time or that we work together on is really setting boundaries um, and working through that work-life balance. Um, sometimes some workplaces, they don't have those things incorporated into their structure and being able to prioritize your self-care and your soul care, as I would call it, um, so that they're able to show up as the best version of themselves. So for some people, they may have work phones or emails. And so we're literally talking about what are some strategies that will work for them um, that will be implemented so that they are not burnt out and they're able to show up for themselves and their families in the best possible way. What would you say to, you know, that work-life balance piece? What does that look like um, for, for some of the viewers that are watching. Yeah, for sure. And so it's so funny. I <laughs> Balance is, a, is an interesting word for me. Um, mm. I believe more so in order and priorities because when you're balancing things and when you're juggling multiple things, something is bound to drop, right? But when we are ordering things and we are prioritizing things, we're saying, this is how I order my life. This is how I order my day. This is how I order my world type of thing, right? So we're making sure that things or are in order as much as possible. And so as a therapist journeying along with individuals, I am now holding them accountable to that aspect of priority and orders that they have set out for their lives. That's fantastic. And now let's talk about, because something that has also really crept up, which has impacted, you know, the instances of people requesting medical assistance and dying and things is isolation and yeah. loneliness. You know, since the pandemic, there's just been a, a much greater level of people just being alone and feeling alone, even when they're surrounded by many others. What are some thoughts that you have to how maybe some of our viewers or people that they know and they love that they see are falling into that social isolation? What are some of the things that they can also do to maybe reach out to a friend or if someone is watching who has been, you know, isolating, isolated themselves? Um, what are some effective ways that they can also, um, get the help that they need so that they are not battling on their own from a mental standpoint? Yeah, for sure. That is such a good question. I think the aspect of community is probably one of the biggest things um, when you're navigating and you're working through your mental and emotional health. So at Soul Care, we have five pillars um, and community is one of those pillars because we believe that iron sharpens iron, right? I believe that we were created to be relational beings, right? And so when we are in isolation, that is not good for our mental and emotional health. And so how do we now build this into our rhythms? How do we build in this aspect of community into our rhythm? So whether that is ensuring, so um, who's on your team? is a big thing, right? So you're building a team of support around you, who's on your team. And mm. so as a therapist, you know, I'm on my client's team, but who else is on your team? How else are you getting out there to ensure that community is an essential part of keeping you together, mm. keeping you grounded, keeping you accountable as you navigate? So for some people that may look like friends and family, for some people, but that may look like their church community, for some people that may look like um, joining some type of club, book club, and even thinking about community that is separate from the work that you do type of thing. So I have a community of therapists, but I don't always want to be talking about therapy and client work. Exactly. Right. So just having friends that you can just laugh and talk with, those things really help to lower our stress levels and really help to keep us present in the moment. Something else that has been in the news cycle a lot over the last few years has been the legalization and decriminalization of drugs, uh, opioids such as heroin, morphine, fentanyl. You know, we've heard and seen a lot, a, a large increase in overdoses. Um, and 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 one of the questions that I, I I had for you is once again for either our viewers or anyone that they may know, what are some of the the signs because often what leads many people into needing these these drugs is 
mental crises, you know, being overwhelmed, feeling stressed out and thinking that it's going to help them in some way. So what are some of the signs that someone may be using a substance to cope with mental stress. Um, and for anyone who's in that sort of a situation, what is something that they can do to try to support someone from that mental health uh, perspective? Hmm. So some of the signs you're going to see changes in behavior. That is going to be one of the biggest things. You are going to see changes in their behavior and how they react to things and how they're navigating through things. Um, and, the signs are always telling before the person gets to that place, right? Um, before they get to any type of drug use or anything like that, the signs are telling before. Um, they're probably more isolated, as you were talking about before, not really want to be in community or around anyone. Uh, they've maybe found new types or new groups of friends that are probably doing some of the same things. Um, they are um, probably depressed. Um, maybe there's some anxiety. And a lot of the times people are using these things to cope, right? So for example, um, mar marijuana usage, people will use these things to cope because they're feeling anxious. So I've had clients say the only reason why I would use this is because it helps me to feel calm. But, you know, since I've been coming to therapy and I have an empathetic witness and I have somebody to hold space for me, I don't necessarily have to use this anymore or um, my, my usage has decreased. But before somebody gets to the drug use, there's likely signs that are coming or that are telling uh, that this person will be in this place. Social media only amplifies something that was there before. And so if you're realizing that there's some comparison, some jealousy, different things like that, there's something deeper there that needs to be attended to. We love Canada and we wanna see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fayteen.tv or call 1-866-844-0844 to donate today. So one of the things that you mentioned is the the way that therapy actually can help that person yes. get, kind of deal with this from that root, uh, get giving it a, the root a solution versus, you know, always maybe targeting the actual behavior. But if we can help this person reduce the stress that they feel, reduce the anxiety that they feel, get connected, feel seen, feel heard, there's less of a likelihood um, that they may be needing to cope by using some of these substances. Thank you for that, that response. You know, another thing that um, I wanted us to talk about, I think this is the hot, like the top uh, you know, a conversation in, in this generation, 2024 right now. Um, and that is social media, Yay. right? So with social media, it's one thing I, I think for a lot of Canadians, yes, they have personal challenges. Yes. There's, you know, affordability and making sure that they can take care of their, their families, their homes. Um, but at the same time, we live in a day where, a regular human being is being exposed to news stories, comparisons of other people's lives. There's just so many things that we see today that back in the day, you, you had enough to manage by yourself. <laughs> you weren't trying to manage the rest of the world at the same time. And so what have you seen in your work with regards to, especially you mentioned you work with a lot of Gen Z, you work with some uh, millennials, um, but even boomers are, are, are up there. You know what I'm saying? Um, so what are you seeing in, in terms of the impact that social media is having on Canadians and our mental health? That could be an entire show, <laughs> all the things all by itself. It has such a significant impact because it's everything is on social media and there's so many different forms of social media. There's Facebook, there's Instagram, there's TikTok. Those are the three that I know about. There's now threads, there's X. 
Watch out. There's so many different things. And I think people underestimate the effects that social media has on their brains and on their mind, on their mental health, um, where it would cause them to feel less than, where it would cause them to feel insignificant. Um, and just the, the trigger. So for example, for myself right now, with all of the things that are happening on social media, I actively choose to disengage on social media. Whether I am praying or I'm talking about it with my friends or different things like that, I actively choose to disengage uh, because I'm like, I cannot put my mental health at risk in this place. And I think a lot of people don't, a lot of people go on social media with their guardrails down, right? We're just, we're just scrolling, we're just here, different things like that. But it's like, in one sense, on one post, you're seeing genocide. And on one post, you're seeing a meme that's making you laugh. Mm. That is weird. <laughs> your mind is not used to, we weren't created for so much movement in our minds and in our brains and different things like that. And so that is one of the big things. Um, people are distracted. I think a lot of people... Um, even uh, aspects of waking up in the morning and the first thing we do is grab our phones or we go on social media. We put our brains and our minds into this hyperactive place before we've even begun the day. Or even when we're going to bed at night, we're scrolling. And I'm guilty of some of these things. And it, it takes a conscious effort not to do these things. Sometimes I'm on social, um, because we're on social media and, you know, at night and this, the, if we're on social media at night and our brain doesn't get a chance to relax before we go to bed, our brain is in hyperactivity and then we are not getting into our REM, REM sleep, right? Um, because of all of the activity that is taking place. So that's the aspect of like your brain head health rather. And then on our mental and emotional health, we compare ourselves to others. If we put something out and nobody likes it, um, it's affecting our self-esteem. But I think something there to be very cognizant of is to realize that social media only amplifies something that has been there before. Ooh, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I want you to say that again for the person in the back. Say that again. Social media only amplifies something that was there before. Social hmm. media is a mirror of a root issue that is taking place. And so if you're realizing that there's some comparison, some jealousy, different things like that, there's something deeper there that needs to be attended to. Ooh, that, that is good. You know, something that I've seen in the work that I do with yeah. helping professionals, uh, business owners scale, you know, in their finances, my work is around finance and neuroscience yeah. and social media is one of those top conversations because yeah. one of the things that I've also seen is that how it impacts people's ability to focus throughout the day. So we have a generation now that generally, like if we need to sit down and just do one thing for a full hour and not be distracted, it's like, it's like torture, you know? Um, and so I, I love what you said there about really being very mindful and intentional in how we engage and how much we expose ourselves to when it comes to social media. Something else that you talked about that I, I just want to really emphasize is that comparison element, because I, I know that, you know, back in the day, once again, they talked about keeping up with the Joneses, yeah. um, but keeping up with the Joneses was Joneses beside you. But now, and now this all over the world. That's exactly right. And, and, and people are often comparing their everyday, you know, regular mundane life with somebody else's best day of the year because yes. that's what's being posted on social media. So, man, I, I, I agree with you. I think that we could probably talk about that a lot more. Yeah. I want to add something to that. I think another part of that, too, is that people are comparing their day one to somebody else's day five. It's just like, you can't do that. <laughs> like, that is that is not um, fair to you, right? And that's also not fair to the other person who has put in the work, who has done their 10,000 hours, and you've done one hour, right? Um, and so it's important to really put things into a frame and into context when you feel that comparison bug creeping up. So for those who are watching, what are some daily practices or habits that they can just really practical stuff that they can adopt in order to improve their mental sharpness, their mental well-being, their mental health? 
Yeah, for sure. So like I spoke about before, there are five pillars of soul care. You can adapt them, implement them into your life. So there's spiritual care, body care, mindfulness, community, self-love and acceptance. And these things can be implemented in your life on any given day. For example, spiritual care, if somebody is a believer, this may look like prayer, reading your Bible, whatever that looks like. Um, mindfulness, this looks like journaling. I think people underestimate journaling and going for a walk. Those two things can really set you up for success, especially mm. going for a walk. I know we live in cold, cold Canada. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, our, our little freezer part of the world. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why some parts of the world are hot and some parts are cold, but you know, we need that up to, to, to the big guy upstairs. Um, but in, in essence, um, taking a walk, um, reading our Bibles, not reading our Bibles, sorry, taking a walk, doing our journaling type of thing, and just taking a walk, just having a mindful moment. Uh, walking can lower our cortisol levels. Like literally walking has so much power. So if we can incorporate that in our lives, and we can be doing um, any aspect of soul care um, more than one. So what I mean by that is, so we can be practicing mindfulness and body care and self-love and acceptance by taking a walk. Um, so for body care, it could be any kind of movement. Again, taking a walk, maybe it's taking a nap throughout the day. If you have capacity to do that, it's going into the gym. Um, what else? There is self-love and acceptance. It's being mindful of your thought life, your internal dialogue, how you speak to yourself. So it's really being an active steward of your life, mm -hmm. right? Um, one of the things that I, I always say to my clients is how can we ensure uh, that we are a priority? When we look at what's on our plate, are you on the plate, right? Are you on the plate? Are you an active, active participant on the plate? And are you prioritizing yourself? And of course, not from a selfish standpoint, not from a selfish place, uh, but from a place of wholeness and wellness, uh, because that is what we were created for. And and I would even add to that, I think it's also stewardship, yes. right? Because if if God has just the same way that we would steward the finances yes. that God releases to us, and we think about how to steward our families well, we think about how to steward the way that we show up at our workplace, um, we also are charged to steward... The, you know, there's, there's a verse in the Bible that says that our, our body is the temple of God, yeah. you know, you know, to be able to steward ourselves yeah. um, and take care of ourselves in that way. So yeah, I, I love that. Yeah. Um, I had one more question for you, you know, what do you believe can be done to make mental health supports more available and more accessible to Canadians. You know, I was specifically, we've been having some conversation on the, the network about uh, medical assistance in dying. And, you know, they, the government had released this, um, this change that they wanted to implement at this point, they've pushed it forward a few years where they wanted to make it available for people who had mental health challenges to be able to request medical um, assistance in dying instead. And, you know, it, it really struck a conversation or a thought in my brain of what if we could take that, that, effort that we are putting into making dying more available to people who have mental health challenges into making mental health supports more available to people who have mental health challenges. What are some of the thoughts that you can give to how we may be able to, to do that for Canadians across the country? It's supporting the community organizations uh, with funding so that they can do this type of work, right? So when we're providing free therapy or any of those things, um, I used to, so before I was in private practice, I was a, uh, a manager of youth justice programs. And, you know, I've done a lot of social work and work in the community and funding is like a rat race. You know what I mean? Um, it's like, we're all fighting from the same funding pools and it's hard, it's inaccessible, but if funding was more accessible to community organizations so that they could access these fundings because a lot of people, whether young people, middle age, old, doesn't matter where you're at, everybody has mental health. And so everybody's mental health needs to be needs to be attended to. I think another aspect of it as well is 
really recognizing the importance of mental health, right? I think we've kind of looked at physical health as more important and as, as men, than mental health, not realizing that the two are just as important and are on the same um, on the same level. Because if my leg is broken, I need to go to the doctor. I can't walk around on my broken leg because it's going to continue to be broken and it's not going to go well, right? And so it's the same thing with our mental health. If somebody's not well mentally, they need support. And so I think it's really building it. Um, as you can tell, I'm really passionate about this. Uh, I think it's really building this into our structures and our systems as Canadian for Canadians. Um, as a part of my private practice, Soul Care Christian Counseling, we have affordable therapy available to individuals at a low cost. So we have um, affordable and accessible therapy. And so it's really creating those type of spaces and realizing and looking at the communities that don't have this type of access and really looking at the systemic issues around that and why is not why is access still not a thing for something that is so important and realizing that uh, mental health, as I said, is just as important as, phys as physical health um, as it is as important as food housing, clothing, all of these things. And the last thing I'll say is really looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's one of my big things, right? So really looking at those things um, and realizing that 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 tip of the iceberg, that self-actualization is really, really important, but realizing that all of these things inform each other. Mm, wow. Jessica, thank you so much for taking the time out of your very full schedule um, to jump on the show and to share your expertise with our viewers. It has been an honor hearing from you. If, there, if people wanted to reach out and engage, can you just uh, let them know how they'd be able to find you? Yeah, for sure. So I am on Instagram. Um, so you can find me at I am She Speaks Truth on Instagram. Um, I am on Threads. Um, under the same name. And you can also find us on our website, thesoulcarecounselor.com. Fantastic. Thank you once again, Jessica, for your time. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you appreciated the program. If you want to watch it again, share it with your friends and loved ones. Simply go to our website at fateen.tv where this episode will be posted as well as other previous ones for your viewing ease. Want to say again, we say it every week, but we need to. Thank you to our monthly donors, our regular partners. You are the ones that allow Fateen TV and friends to continue week after week speaking to important issues for our times from C to see in Canada and every gift really makes a difference. So if you'd like to give a special gift today, simply go to fateen.tv to give securely online or you can also give us a call at 1-866-844-0844 and speak to one of our team members over the phone. If you'd like to sign up to become a monthly partner, you can also do that online or over the phone. Our team is always there ready to speak to you, to serve you and even pray for your personal prayer needs. If you want to make sure that you never miss a show, go to our website, sign up for the email list, and that will ensure that you are notified every time a new program is posted so that you never miss an episode. Thank you for joining us. Hope to see you next week.